I am Yerim Capaldo of Tufts University's Global Development and Environment Institute. We're here with Angus Deaton, Dwight D. Eisenhower Professor of Economics at Princeton University and recipient of the 2014 Leontief Prize for Advancing the Frontier of Economic Thought. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. So um, most studies of inequality uh, focus on inequality of income, while you have focused on inequality of health too. Um, can you tell us what we can learn from this approach and whether you find it equally informative in all countries? Okay. So I think that um, I, I'm really, in that sense, I'm a disciple of Amartya Sen, who was actually one of the first um, winners here, um, first awardees. Um, and I think it's a terrible mistake to define well-being too narrowly so that you, you get into terrible problems if you look only at income. And I think you also get into terrible problems if you look only at health. And then there are other things which I haven't dealt so much with but are important too, like education, participation in democracy, mm -hmm. freedom of violence, and all these things. So you really do have to take a holistic measure of well-being. And so to look just at the progress in terms of income or to look at inequality in terms of income misses a very large part of the picture. And the way the world is typically is that you know, those who have a lot of income are those who do very well in health, too. And similarly, those who have very little are typically those who do very badly in terms of health. So that when you glue income and health together, you think about them both together. There's actually a lot more inequality in the world and within countries, indeed, than you would have thought if you'd stuck to the traditional income. So I'm not abandoning income. It's just that you have to bring health into the picture, too. Very good. And you have noted that uh, inequality of income um, is a relatively modern phenomenon uh, arising sometime in the 18th century. No, uh, inequality of health. Uh, sorry, inequality yeah. of health. Um, yeah. And um, why is this important? And, um, and well, it's, it's always very interesting to go back to the roots of something mm -hmm. and see you know, where it came from. We don't know for sure, but there's this remarkable divergence in the middle of the 18th century in Britain mm -hmm. between the life expectancy of the aristocrats and the ordinary people, which mm -hmm. until then, as far as we can tell, the data are not great. Um, as far as we can tell, they're pretty much the same. And what it looks like, and in my book, The Great Escape, I talk about this at some length, what it looks like is there was a whole bunch of new innovations that came along in the second half of the 18th century. Uh -huh. So sort of, this was the time of the British Enlightenment. People were inquiring into everything. They were trying to use reason to improve their lives. And there was a lot of new methods that came along then. And those new methods, it turned out, were adopted first by the very wealthy, and then later trickled down to the rest of the population. So a lot of the birth of that gradient in health started because of new innovation. And I think that was true then, and I think it's by and large true now. So that when new stuff comes along, the better off people or the more educated people tend to get it first. Now, provided the trickle down actually works, that seems like a really good thing because that's the harbinger of improvements for everyone. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, and you know, there are examples today. I mean, we've known for a really long time that smoking is really bad for you. <laughs> but you know, the, there's now, you know, if you go back, 50 years, um, you know, when the Surgeon General went to the press conference to introduce his report on smoking, he was actually chain smoking in the back of the <laughs> car, right? And his aides said to him, you know, the first question you're going to get asked is, are you a smoker? And he said, that's outrageous. It's nothing to do with that. And that's my personal behavior. This is public health. And they said, it's not my fault, you know, that's what you get asked. And of course, that was the first question he's asked. They said, are you a smoker? He said, no. All right. They said, how long did you quit? He said, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and then what happened was a huge number of better off educated people in the US quit smoking mm -hmm. around that time. But poor uneducated people, to some extent, never have. And so we need to understand that better and why that inequality still persists. So, you know, I'm not claiming these rich first is always going to work. Mm -hmm. It's worked in a lot of things. You know, I mean, the, the 18th century aristocrats who got predict, protected from smallpox, you know, by 60 years later, everybody yes. was being protected by smallpox. Yeah. So that was a really good thing. Thank you for that. Um, so speaking of rich and poor, since you mentioned, you have made the point in some of your writing that uh, in the U.S., uh, inequality of income 
uh, can be a threat to health. Yes. How do you see that um, relationship working? And do you only see it in the US? No, I think it's a potential problem everywhere. Um, I think that it's probably more serious um, in the US right now. I mean, the problem, I think, is that you've got these enormous inequalities in income. Those are turning into inequalities in wealth because if you earn $200 million a year, it's sort of hard to spend it. And so eventually, you have an enormous amount of um, wealth. Um, and then you can use that wealth to do things that might not be good for the rest of us. And one of those things you might do is to oppose health care reform, mm -hmm. to impose making health care. And in fact, right now, um, a lot of what you see on television um, that is aimed at um, stopping Obamacare um, is generated from very, very wealthy individuals who are doing that. Now, of course, it's not just one way. I mean, there are very wealthy people on the other side, too. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily right versus left. It, it, what I'm worried about is this sort of plutocracy, and very rich people don't need public health care. They don't need public education. They don't use it. They're going to work against that. So I think that's a real worry. Thank you. So, so far, we've talked about mostly inequality of health within countries. Mm -hmm. But we also know that there are large inequalities between countries. Right. Is there a relationship between the two? Yeah. Um, that I think the huge inequalities across countries come f ultimately from the same sources within countries, that there were technical innovations that we take for granted in our healthcare, like complete vaccination for kids, for instance, that just have not reached a lot of the rest of the world. And I actually think that's because of lack of political capacity, by and large, in poor countries. I don't think it's a matter of money. And I actually don't think you could do much about it through foreign aid. Through far, the one way in which foreign aid I think is tremendously useful is on spurring new discoveries in the health field, mm -hmm. which are of use in, um, to people who are not represented in the, by the US taxpayers, mm -hmm. for instance. So I think that would be a really useful thing. Thank you. Let's widen the angle for a minute. And uh, we have seen, we've talked about health inequality, and um, as you've pointed out, that is one dimension of well being. Yep. And so let's talk about measures. A, a famous measure of well being has been um, self reported well being. But right. there is a problem with that because it hasn't um, appeared to be related with um, income growth over the years. Actually, I think that's wrong. You, um, is that wrong? Yeah. Great. So I, the, the, I think the modern work is suggesting that it has uh -huh. been going up with it. Okay. So does that mean that we can or we should give up um, the focus on economic growth as a guide to public policy? Or can, how can we integrate? Uh, well, it would be a really, if I really believe that economic growth did not generate any increase in well-being, then I would be in an unfortunate position having to choose between giving <laughs> up on economic growth or deciding these measures were no good. Unfortunately, I think the science is showing that that belief was sort of false. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's interesting because it's really tied up with inequality. So the one thing we do know is that increases in income have much more effect on the well-being of poor people than they do on the well-being of rich people. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, we've had all this economic growth, but none of it's gone to the middle people. So in fact, the fact that the middle people um, have had no increase in life satisfaction at all is exactly what you would predict. They haven't seen any growth either. So it's the inequality that's keeping that down, not the lack of growth. So I think if we'd had a much more equal society with the fruits of GDP growth more equally distributed, mm -hmm. then well-being would have gone up too. Thank you. And so talking about statistics and indicators, again, we um, have um, seen that um, measures of um, global development, actually global measures of development, as opposed to national measures mm -hmm. of development, have undergone in recent years sometimes major adjustments. Um, sure. I'm talking, for example, about the numbers of hungry people or yeah. the numbers of poverty. Yet policy hasn't adjusted um, accordingly. And so the question arises whether these measures are less relevant than we would like them to be and uh, what we can do to improve them. Well, that's a really big question, and I spend a lot of my time thinking mm -hmm. about those things. Um, I don't think the measures are very relevant, actually, because I don't think they tie into policy at all. Um, the World Bank doesn't use them in its policy making. The IMF doesn't use them. No national government uses those numbers. So I think they're largely consumed by activists. The Pope cares a lot about them. Um, Bono and Angelina Jolie seem to care about them a lot. 
but I'm not sure they feed into policy. So I think development policy was a failure before these numbers were adjusted. I think it's a failure after these numbers are adjusted, and I think the numbers are pretty much irrelevant, except for people who are curious about, um, as I am, about international inequality and international growth. Thank you. And so what can we do to uh, obtain better statistics, or what is the type of statistic that we should invest in? I think we're doing OK. Um, I think there's improvement going on. I think international agencies need to be shamed because I don't think they ought to be ch in charge of the statistics by which they themselves are judged. Uh -huh. So I think it's a really bad idea that the World Bank holds itself up to a poverty target and then measures how well it's doing. Um, the UN has not been very good about hunger statistics. The FAO you know, comes out with these numbers, no one knows where they come from, and then they say there are 200 million more people, you ought to give us more money. Uh -huh. And I think if we were serious about these global statistics, we ought to have a much more careful global architecture of statistical production, more like we have in domestic. But there's no international government. Mm -hmm. And statistics, you know, the, the stat in statistics, it comes from the state. <laughs> and, you know, statistics are done carefully when they really feed into the policy of some government. Yes. The international statistics don't, and so no one really cares about them. They may pretend to. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.